We're about to get into God's word together and study what he has for us today. Uh, we're going to be in a text that maybe most of you are familiar with. It's kind of an uh, important one. And uh, I, I want to kind of dive into it and kind of pull it apart together this morning. But before we get there, I want to ask this. Have you ever had a meeting that you didn't want to go to? <laughs> Do you have them all the time? I mean, let's be real. Uh, whoever wants to be in a meeting. But have you ever had one specifically that you knew it wasn't going to go well and you're kind of dreading it? Okay, like if you ever went to the principal's office, which I never did, so I can't, uh, I can't relate there. It never happened to me. Just don't ask my parents. Um, or maybe a meeting with your boss, right? Uh, or maybe you're like me and sometimes you did foolish things and you knew mom and dad were waiting at home, right? Uh, and in those moments, you're filled with maybe some trepidation. You're apprehensive, nervous, scared, maybe even trembling. With that in mind, uh, we're going to rewind a little bit about five centuries from today. Uh, It was the afternoon of April 16th, 1521, when a young Catholic priest named Martin Luther rolled into the German town of Worms. I practice that a lot, okay? It's spelled worms, which is misleading, okay? Um, But it's Uh, Worms. So they rolled into town in a two-wheeled cart with a small gang of supporters, Accounts of the event record that Luther was physically fearful and trembling. The reason was that he had been summoned to appear before an imperial council, which is called a diet. Yes, that means he was invited to a diet of worms, but that's not the reason he was nervous. At the heart of the issue was that Luther had issued 95 arguments or doctrinal statements that challenged a number of practices and beliefs long held by the Catholic Church. As he went about teaching and explaining his ideas throughout his region of Germany, he gained popularity. And Pope Leo X issued an official statement demanding that Luther recant 41 of his statements. Luther refused and burned the letter publicly. If you want to know how to end up in the principal's office, this is how you end up in the principal's office. Later that evening, Luther was called to give a defense of his doctrines. Get this, in front of Emperor Charles V, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, and a representative of the Pope named Aleander. On the Pope's behalf, Aleander demanded that Luther be condemned without a trial, but fearing public backlash, they figured they should have a trial. Luther would have faced arrest and almost certainly execution as a heretic. I think you might be feeling a little apprehensive ahead of this meeting at the principal's office. As he arrived, people lined the streets to see him. He was greeted with a rock star's welcome by the common people, and many of them cheered him on. Some of the German noblemen encouraged him, saying, Be bold and fear not those who can kill the body, but are powerless against the soul. At the imperial council, Luther gave a passionate and historic argument and declared that he would not recant even a single line unless he could be convinced that he was in error by reason, or by scripture. Several weeks later, the emperor did, in fact, issue a formal judgment calling for Luther's arrest. He was excommunicated and was hidden away in secret for several years by a local prince. Now, you might wonder why we are wading into 500-year-old theology debates. But this is important, because at the center of this fight and at the heart of the Protestant Reformation was the most important question that any person can ask. How are we saved? Is it by faith alone? Or is it by faith and other means? For Luther, he couldn't ignore the sense that he was increasingly gripped by the scriptures to be convinced that it was not by faith plus something, but that it was by faith alone that we are saved, not by works, not by indulgences, which were gifts of money that were accepted for forgiveness by the church, not by participating in the sacraments, but as a free and unbelievable gift of grace given by God to undeserving sinners received by faith. 
you can see this starting to form in his thinking. Two of his lines specifically kind of, you can kind of see how this was developing early on in his thoughts. Uh, Thesis number 36 said, every Christian who truly repents of his sins enjoys an entire remission, both of the penalty and of the guilt, without any need of indulgences. What does that mean? How is someone forgiven? Someone's forgiven through their own repentance. Anyone can come freely to God and have forgiveness of sins by repentance and faith, not through works, not through indulgences, not through any other means. And the following thesis, number 37, said this, every true Christian, whether dead or alive, participates in all the blessings of Christ or of the church by God's gift and without a letter of indulgence. We would, at LifeBridge, as a Protestant church, passionately agree. Amen? We are saved by grace through faith. We would agree with Luther that we're saved that way. And yet, the New Testament is full of commandments about works. In fact, we are required over and over in the New Testament to do and be a people of good works. And so there's this awkward tension in the scriptures that we're left with when it comes to faith and works. I think the relationship between faith and works has always been a little awkward like a boyfriend and girlfriend that are on and off again all the time. They're constantly struggling to define the nature of their relationship, right? Today, we're going to turn to an important scripture in Ephesians chapter two, which deals with this issue and I think can help us understand the nature of the relationship between the two. But before we start reading God's word together, let's pray. God, we confess today that you are God and we are not. You have, because of your great mercy, given us the scriptures in order to reveal to us your whole counsel, to demonstrate to us how we are to live, to communicate to us how we can have relationship and forgiveness and how we can be your people in the world. Today we come under the authority of your word because we come under your authority. And so God, we ask you to shape us through your word and God, allow your Holy Spirit to work in us to make us more like you, so that as individuals and as a church, that you would be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're gonna read in Ephesians chapter two, starting in verse one, which starts off this way, and you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, According to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. This passage starts with a reality check. It describes just how bad things are for us without Christ. We could say this describes our life BC, before Christ. We could call it our prior state. And the Apostle Paul describes for us in three pretty clear ways, uh, basically our prior state without Jesus. Speaking to a non-Jewish audience, the Apostle Paul says to them, first, here's the first thing that describes our life before Christ. You lived according to the ways of the world. What does that mean? It means that before Christ, our previous lives were more concerned with what others think than what God thinks. Outside of Jesus, our attitudes and ideas tend to be shaped more by the attitudes, ideas, and beliefs of our culture than by the word of God itself. In a nutshell, you could say that apart from Christ, our lives are brainwashed by patterns of thinking that don't come from God but come from the world, this is a problem because the effect is that we become numb and resistant to the ways of God without even knowing it. And this is why constantly I hear, uh, it's very common in, in the church that people will come to church or encounter the gospel for the first time and they'll say, well, I like God and I like Jesus, but I don't like the things that you believe, right? Or I'll like the idea of church. I like the idea of Jesus, but I don't align myself with what scripture says on this topic. Why is it that we are so naturally 
wired to resist what God has said because we have been molded and blinded by human thinking to default to culture rather than the world, the word of God. And it makes God's commands seem foreign and strange to us. And so one of the processes that we have to go through as believers when we come to Jesus is unwinding all of that thinking and that entangled thought process and allow the counsel of God's word to shape our thinking, which is why Romans 12 says uh, very famously not to be conformed to the patterns of the world, but instead to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's an unwinding process that as we come to Christ, we don't come and get fixed right away, right? It's a slow process that one of the ways in which God works in us is the Holy Spirit through the power of the word unwinds the misinformation that we've believed, okay? So that's the first way Paul describes it. Second, he says that his audience has lived according to the ruler of the power of the air. Now let's break that down a little bit. He's talking about Satan, the enemy of our souls, the evil one. Paul refers to him as the ruler of the power of the air. Even though he's been defeated by the victory of Christ on the cross, Satan still maintains a powerful influence in the world, in the hearts and minds of those who do not know Jesus. And without knowing it, before Christ, we fell prey to his deception. Before Christ, we were deceived and influenced by spiritual powers that we didn't even recognize and over which we had no power. Now, it's good news that the church has been unleashed by God in this age to do battle against the forces of darkness by preaching the gospel and by ministering in Jesus' name. But the enemy of our souls is still active in our world and poses a very real threat. Third, Paul says it's not just outside forces that have influenced us, but also Jews and non-Jews alike have lived in their fleshly desires, carrying out their impulses and their thoughts. Our decision-making, we have to admit, without Jesus, has not been focused on what brings honor to God or by a desire to obey him, but instead the ruling force in our lives that we have been slave to without even knowing it is that we live for our own pleasure, seeking to satisfy our selfish desires above all else. And if we're honest, without Christ, we desire that far more than we desire to obey or glorify God. And all three of these things have one thing in common, that before Christ, we are powerless. We're slaves to our own desires and thoughts. We're blinded and manipulated by worldly ways of thinking, and we fall under the influence of spiritual forces who are out to bring about our demise. The result, Paul says, is we are dead. We might be walking, talking physical bodies, but our spiritual condition is death. We're zombies, the walking dead, we're animated. We move, but we're dead to the ways of God, incapable of obedience or relationship with him. Paul goes on, if that's not bad enough news, Paul goes on to say that we're also then children of wrath, destined to receive destruction because of our willingness to rebel against God and make ourselves the gods of our own lives. And there is nothing we can do about it. That's bad news, especially if we're saved by works. That's really bad news. We cannot be saved by good works because apart from Christ, we're incapable of them. Thankfully, that's not where the passage ends. Here's the good news. It starts with the best two words in all of scripture, but God, but God. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. What's the good news? You were dead. Guess what dead people can do about being dead? Nothing. But because he is rich in mercy and because he loves you, God made us alive. You are saved by grace. Verse 6 says, he also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Isn't it good that God is kind to us? Isn't that so sweet? So we read about our prior state. Now think about what Paul says about our lives after Christ. He says, if we've been found by Christ, we're made alive. 
We're brought alive as God breathes new life into us and awakens us to his ways. We're saved by grace. We're no longer destined for destruction and wrath, but instead mercy in life. He says also we're raised up with him and seated in the heavens, which means we're brought into a unity with God now through Jesus. We now exist in a continuous communion with him in which we interact with the living creator who dwells within us by the breath of God, the Holy Spirit, who lives inside those who trust in Christ. And lastly, Paul says, we're given a hope that what we have in store from God in the future is that he will continue to show us his kindness and grace forevermore. Why? So that his kindness and grace can be displayed through us to the world. Think about what Paul just described and consider what lies behind you. Take a minute and think about where you've been and what God has done. Consider what lies behind you. Hopelessness, slavery, despair, corruption. Now consider your present and your future. You're not hopeless anymore. You're not a slave anymore. You've been made new and now all the wealth of God's promises are yours. You're not dead anymore. But the breath of the Almighty stirs within you, slowly changing you from the inside out to transform you bit by bit to work all the old ways out and make you a new creation. What happened? Jesus Christ happened. But God, rich in mercy, because of love, acted to save through the work of Jesus. The difference between our past And our future is the work of Jesus. Any discussion of works, any discussion of good works, anything about faith and works has to start with this point. This is takeaway one today, and it's so important. We are saved because of good works, but they're not ours. We are saved by the good work of Jesus Christ. The only way you can be transformed into a future, a future full of glory is the work of Jesus. The only way you can be saved from hopelessness to hope and sorrow to joy and death to life, despair to celebration, from wrath to mercy, there is one way, the work of Jesus. Because while we were sinners and children of wrath, Jesus grabbed his hard hat and his lunch pail and he went to work. He toiled and strived and spent himself completely until he was hanging from a cross and breathed his last and he lived a life of perfect good works. And then he offered those works up to God in exchange for the sins of mankind. So now God's grace has been made available as a free gift and you can have it by faith if you receive it by confessing Jesus as the son of God. And if you do, God now sees you not in terms of your past life. God doesn't see old works. God doesn't see you any longer as a sinner condemned to wrath. But now he sees the perfect works of Christ in you because they've been given freely to you. Trust in Christ. Paul goes on to say this in verse 8. This is the part that I'm sure we've all heard. For you are saved by grace, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. How do you receive it? You can't earn it. It's a gift. What you have to do is accept it. And the good news is, if we have accepted it, do you know what we can do? We can rest. We can rest from the weariness of trying to earn God's approval and God's favor and God's acceptance. Don't we all have that little voice in the back of our head who we know that we're saved by grace through faith, but there's just that little piece of us that still says you're not good enough. You're not meeting the qualifications. You're going too far and those promises are not for you. Don't we all have that reflex that still is just a little bit convinced that yeah, it's mostly God, but I know there's gotta be some standard there and I'm not meeting it. The truth of the gospel is that if we're in Christ, we can rest from that type of thinking because it's not by works or human effort that we're saved. And because of that, I think there are two attitudes we have to watch out for. First of all is this, we should not trust in our own goodness to save us. Being good will never save because no one is good except God alone. But here's the other part of that. It's not simply boasting that's rejected. It's also despair 
that's defeated. No one in Christ can ever say, there's no way I can be saved. No one in Christ can ever say, I'm too far gone. Jake, you don't know the things that I carry with me. You don't know what I've done. You don't understand the hurt that I've caused. My friends, grace runs deeper. Sin abounds, but grace abounds all the more. Amen? That's the good news of the gospel. We can rest, trust in Christ's work and rest. So then we'd say, all right, I get it. Works don't matter. We're free. We're saved. That's it. There's nothing I have to do now, right? Not so fast, partner. Paul keeps going. Point number two today would be this. Good works are the goal and the result of salvation. Paul goes on to say this in verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Here's the relationship that Paul sees. We don't have to work for our salvation. Jesus has done the work. But because Jesus has gone to work for us, now it's our turn to get to work. It's been said before, and I don't know by who, that grace is opposed to earning, not effort. Christ has worked for us, Paul says, and now it's time for people who are his to get to work. This is an important distinction that we have to recognize. We are not saved by our own good works. We're saved by Christ's work, but he's made us his workmanship so that we can do work. The goal of the gospel was that God would create new people who were no longer the walking dead, but the walking doers. Titus chapter two and verse 14 says this. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession eager to do good works. What is the way to respond to the immeasurable grace and mercy that Christ has shown us? It is to be workers because this is the goal of our salvation. The gospel is not complete in us until God's glory begins to be displayed through us. So good works are the goal of salvation, but good works are also the result of salvation. I recently got to walk through a friend's farm and visit his mushroom growing operation. (laughs) This was uh, new for me. I'm not a mushroom farmer. I never have been. So it was a learning experience. And I learned about the process by which he grew shiitake mushrooms. I think I can say that in church. Um, The process goes like this. They would soak logs and then lay them out in a dark, damp area of the woods. Then they would cover them in mushroom spores, and the spores start to work their way down into the wood, where they develop roots underneath the surface. And eventually, as the spores feed upon the wood and the nutrients and, and soak up the nutrients within, small mushroom heads start to sprout and poke their way up through the surface of the tree, and then they grow until they're harvested. When I talked to him, he mentioned that he hoped that the weather wouldn't dry out so that the mushrooms didn't sprout. Now, I thought that was a little weird because I would think that as a mushroom farmer, you would want to grow mushrooms. But when I asked him about it, uh, he said that if they didn't dry out before winter, what would happen is that the spores would have all winter to stay in the wood and work their way through the logs. And the logs would break down within and provide more nutrients to the fungus inside. Then in the spring, the first time the weather dried out, the mushrooms would explode like crazy and they'd have a bigger harvest. So it's interesting that when it comes to mushroom farming, (laughs) I guess you didn't think you were gonna hear uh, how the gospel is similar to mushroom farming today. Um, But what you see on the surface is just a result of the transformation process going on inside. Good works don't define our relationship with God, but they do describe it. It's as if we could say, good works provide color commentary on our salvation. The proof of God's workmanship in us is how we live. So what is a good work? What counts as good works? I define good works this way. Good works are acts of love extended by believers on behalf of Jesus for the benefit of others as an outworking of God's grace at work in their inner person. If that's a bit wordy, I could say it this way. Good works are works done in love of others, out of love for Christ. Good works don't make us Christians, but good works are like the receipts that are God's proof of purchase. 
Recently, my wife and I went shopping at Old Navy, and as we like to do, we hit the clearance racks. Right? This is kind of where we live. This is our area of the store, right? And my wife purchased a pair of jeans for like three and a half bucks, okay? And so we check out, we go home, the jeans sit on a shelf for a couple weeks, and as she goes to put them on in preparation for, you know, she's anticipating wearing these brand new jeans, and as soon as she starts to put them on, she realizes that they forgot something and that the ink package that's supposed to explode or whatever, the anti-theft device, is still on her jeans, okay? And, uh, and so what she had to do is walk back or go back to the store and walk in and try to convince them that she wasn't a shoplifter and had actually purchased the jeans legally. There's just one problem. You need something to prove that, don't you? You need a receipt. Now, luckily for Old Navy, uh, they, uh, they keep, or luckily for us, I guess, not for them, uh, they keep track of those things if you use a card, whatever, so they're able to locate it. My wife didn't end up in jail. That's good news. But the only way that they could tell the difference between a thief and a paying customer was a receipt. And in the same way, we would say, uh, yes, it's possible you can be a Christian without good works. You can come to church on Sundays. You can believe in Jesus Christ. You can confess all of the things that we confess on paper. You can be a Christian without good works. You just can't prove it. A healthy Christian, I'd say this, and this will wreck your morning, is a fungusy, scummy Christian. God takes root in their heart and works his way through until we produce fruit. This quote probably says it in a much better way. As trees are created for fruits which God prepared before that they should bear them, He designed and assigned to each tree its own in form and flavor and time of bearing. So in the course of God's providence, our good works are marked out for and assigned to each one of us. God has prepared in advance. He's planned this. And he has works that he has prepared for you, for I, and for us. And this brings us back to what we've been talking about for several weeks now, which is the idea of building bridges, because what we've been talking about is a life of good works, lived to build relationships with others so that others may find their way to God, right? And what we've cast a vision for is it's through the work of the church, joining God as God's at work in the world, that we actually build connections with people and see God call the world back to him. This is the mission of God at work. And we've covered, I I, I made a deal with you. I said, I'll teach you seven simple practices over these few weeks that will help us live on mission with God. And if we do these things, we will see God build bridges to people who don't know him and we will see life transformed and the church grow. Right? And here's what we said. We started with uh, beginning in prayer for people who don't know Jesus yet. Then reaching out and including them. Then dialoguing with them across the table in conversation. Gathering around the table together and inviting them in. And then today we would say the next step is that we engage in good works. We engage them in action. We find ways to demonstrate our faith in action and in good works for the world to see good works are a primary way in which we reach out to build bridges with others. So what are good works? I think that we can identify several biblical categories of good works to help you understand what types of things are good works. First, acts of service. Service is acts that benefit others, plain and simple. When we serve others, we do something not for our own benefit, but for theirs. I think biblically, we'd also say acts of mercy. We define mercy as acts of compassion and kindness. Now, I don't mean to get controversial here. And so if we see these things differently, know that LifeBridge is a safe place to disagree. But we saw an example of an act of mercy recently in the news, didn't we? If you guys remember... A couple weeks ago, there was a trial going on in Dallas for uh, a female police officer who had killed a young man by entering the wrong apartment. It was kind of a crazy thing, and people are all up in arms about it online. And then the, the craziest thing happened, right? And that's that as the victim's brother took the stand, he stepped down from the stand, went to his brother's killer, embraced her in a hug, encouraged her to turn her life to Jesus, and forgave her. It was an act of mercy, one which we should applaud, (laughs) right? We would say this glorifies God. We would also say that biblically we are called to acts of justice. 
just as we would say our acts that right wrongs or advocate on behalf of those who have been wronged. Justice is setting things right according to God's standards and God's laws. Now, this is where I want to ask your forgiveness if we see this differently, but I would say this. Forgiveness was extended in that case, and consequences were still given because an innocent life was taken. This was also glorifying to God. And I don't mean to step on any toes by saying that. We can say both as Christians that wrongs should be righted and mercy should be extended. Amen? And we would do well in the eyes of our culture to remember both of those things instead of picking sides, wouldn't we? We would also say that works of proclamation are good works. Works of proclamations are acts that communicate the gospel message of Jesus, not just necessarily evangelism, but also worship preaching, praying, anytime we speak the truths of the gospel, we speak the truth of Christ, we worship God for the world to hear. That's proclamation. And the last category, you're gonna have to wait till the end. All right, um, we'll get there. So why does it matter so much that we build bridges? Why are we doing this? Why are we so focused on wanting to do good works? Why are we spending so many weeks on this? Takeaway number four is this, and this is important because this comes from Jesus himself. By rendering service to others, we render service to the Lord. This is a deep, beautiful, profound truth of God's word. Jesus himself gives us this understanding of why we do good works. If you remember Matthew chapter five, Jesus said this in the clearest picture that he could give of his church and their role in the world. He said, you are the light of the world. Who's the you? That's us. That's the church. You're the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and do what? Give glory to your Father in heaven. Good works are a glory mechanism. When the church does good works, God gets glory. And that's the point. When the people of God do good works, God puts his goodness on display. Christians are those who embrace God's call to do battle against the powers of darkness and division and death in this world by jumping into the chaos to rescue others and call them to join us in Christ. And as the church goes to work in those things, God gets glory glory. We love others genuinely. We spend our effort to serve them because that is how God has set in place that his people should worship him. And that is our purpose. The purpose we were created for is that God wants to put himself on display as you carry out the God-given works that he has assigned for you and prepared for you. And as you carry out the works God has planned for you, God puts his love, mercy, grace, and kindness on display in your life. So long as you are living for yourself, you'll never discover true purpose. This is why Paul said all human boasting is out, but if you boast in Jesus, that's what we were made for. That is true joy. And so as God's people... We work because he has designed a job for us. Ask yourself today, do you know your purpose? Here it is. Glorify God by spending yourself for the sake of others. And you might ask, how how do I know what good works to do? That still seems pretty vague. I'd say this, get started and you'll probably figure it out. Get started, listen to the Holy Spirit, and he'll figure it out for you. Takeaway number five today would be this, and this will be the last one that I didn't give you. To complete our list, there's one final biblical category of works, and that's discipleship. The S in our bridges acronym would be bridge builders send other bridge builders. Think about this. If we're gonna be, and forgive me, if we're gonna be scummy, fungusy Christians, (laughs) why do mushrooms sprout? Mushrooms sprout so that they can open up and drop spores, which create more mushrooms, which create more spores, which create more mushrooms, and so on and so forth. In the same way, Christians do good works in the hopes that we will leave behind seeds that eventually grow in the hearts of others. The greatest good work that we can do in this life is to be a part of someone else becoming a follower of Jesus. 
I don't know today what type of legacy you're looking to leave in your life. Maybe the legacy you want to leave is to make sure your debts are paid and hand down some of what you've earned to the next generation. That's a noble goal. But I will tell you this, the greatest legacy you can ever leave is to bring someone into the family of God. Our efforts to make disciples will be even more effective when we commit to engage others in action and service. Jesus' message was demonstrated in service and ours will be too. Some final points I wanna leave you with because I think it's fun to say some practical points on how to be good, scummy Christians because I think that's all something we can agree we wanna be. Uh, Just to share with you where that comes from, my favorite, if I had a life verse, and I don't really know if I agree with the idea of having a life verse, it would be this, 1 Corinthians 4, starting in chapter 12, when we are reviled, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we respond graciously. Even now, we're like the scum of the earth, like everyone else's garbage. There's a life verse for us, isn't it? How about we put that on the wall out there? See you later. Remember that you're scum and garbage, right? That's not gonna fill the seats anytime soon. But I love it. I love this idea. How do we seek to be good, scummy Christians? Paul's idea is we do it through committing ourselves to good works. I'd say this. How do we be good, scummy Christians? First of all is embrace grunt work. Did you know that there is no job too low for a Christian? Right? Christians are the people that scrub toilets for the glory of God. Amen? Think about this. Jesus went to the cross with fingers that were still wrinkly from washing his disciples' feet and calluses on his hands from working. There is no job too low for us. The second way that we become good, scummy, fungal Christians (laughs) is we get comfortable in dark places. My friends, where do mushrooms grow and multiply? In dark places. Where do the church's good works shine the brightest? In dark places. Christians are those who intentionally leave the gathering place and go back to the dark places in our world to carry the love and the goodness of Christ so that we can put it on display for the world to see. We can be good, scummy Christians by being lights and not just megaphones. Do you notice that when Jesus said we're to be a city on a hill, a light in the world, he said be a light, not a megaphone? Here's what we often think. We think doing good works. We think loving mercy. We think loving justice means hopping on Facebook and giving an opinion about stuff. Don't we? Isn't, I mean, how do you judge whether someone cares? Don't, isn't it just, well, if you've posted something about it on social media, then you must really care about justice, right? I don't mean to sound cynical. Let it not be so for us. The church... Wherever there's pain in the world, wherever there is wrong in the world, the church should be quietly at work behind the scenes bringing light into the darkness, right? Don't get me wrong. There are times to be a megaphone too, but more often than not, God calls us to be lights, not just megaphones. We can also be good scummy Christians by boasting only in Christ. We must rid ourselves of all other goals, all other concerns, all other ends, and we must have as one singular focus that we desire above all else that God would get glory, which means we reject everything, including approval and human concerns and even safety and comfort and self-exaltation as our goals. The glory of God alone should be our goal. And lastly, we can be good Scummy Christians by dropping spores. This analogy is the worst, I know. It's gonna go on the record books. It's one of the worst ever. I get it. But we, we become that way by multiplying ourselves and others by dropping spores. Let me tell you, my friends, there is no one in this room who is not capable of discipling someone else. Putting your arm around somebody and walking with them towards Jesus. And when we do these things, We will see the church, like mushroom spores in a log, start to work its way down deep into our society, below the surface. And no matter what happens, God will be faithful to cause it to advance, and he will use it. This week, this week, a candidate for a major party in the United States of America advocated before a national TV audience 
that the tax exempt status of churches be revoked. Let me tell you, I suspect that this opinion will gain traction. I've been asked several times since, well, what, what, do, you, what do you think? What are, what are we going to do? And my friends, my answer to that is exactly what we always do. We continue to build bridges. The church goes to work. We grab our hard hat, we grab our lunch pail, and we go to work for Jesus. I read this, and I think it's so good. They can take away our tax status. They can censor our sermons. They can criminalize our doctrine. They can outlaw our worship. They can burn our buildings, and they can throw us in jail. The gospel of Jesus Christ and his church marches on. Yeah, it's good. So let us not grow weary of doing good works. One big thing I'd leave you with today is this. Because of the work of Jesus, we engage the world around us through good works and embrace the work of making disciples. I'd ask you to consider today how might we engage our neighborhoods and communities in good works? How would God have us joyfully serve? How might you allow God to work through you this week to display himself to the people and places around you? Let me tell you, Jesus is coming back, my friends. And on the day of his appearing, may the Lord find his church full of faith and active in good works. Let's pray.